You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Jason Pinter. Writers, I have an amazing tool to tell you about. A revolutionary writing tool for planning stories. Campfire Pro is what novelists need to go from the seed of an idea to a detailed plan that's ready to be executed. Complete your character design, create a timeline, and track your world building all in one place with our downloadable desktop app for Mac and PC. Without the annoying subscription model so many apps are using today, visit CampfireTechnology.com for special holiday pricing on Campfire Pro today. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website your home on the web where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great looking professional website. Developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates, PubSite is the new easy to use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, Update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning professional looking website with all the features you want get a custom domain name yourname.com it's simple to update you can add all of your books add a blog and a book tour sell from any retailer manage your email list and social media and even do e-commerce build your website with a 14-day free trial then pay just $19.99 per month which includes hosting and we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. The Feisty Heroine Romance Collection of Short Stories. Over 30-plus pulse racing shorts to capture your heart with USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and award-winning authors in the mix. Paranormal, contemporary, fantasy, and historical romance that will whet your appetite with titillating, heart-pounding tales you'll want to read again, then beg for more. Fall in love with your next book crush. Pre-order this amazing collection of shorts, over 30 pulse-pounding stories, for only 99 cents. Proceed with caution. Buying this collection may lead to addictive reading, falling in love with your next book crush, and staying up past your bedtime to see what happens next. Get your limited edition copy of Feisty Heroines. Look for the link in the show notes of this episode. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Jason Pinter on the show with me today. He has a phenomenal new book, and it's the first book in a new series. It's called Hide Away. And it's book one of the Rachel Marin Thriller series. Welcome to the show, Jason. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm excited to have you. Um, Jason, we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, definitely. I mean, it all came from being a reader first and foremost. Um, I was a huge reader growing up. Uh, I loved uh, sort of the early detective novels. I was a big fan of Hardy Boys and Encyclopedia Brown, and then sort of graduated to uh, epic fantasy. I was a big fan of uh, Brian Jacques and Terry Brooks. Um, and then I graduated to Stephen King. And I think I, my earliest memories of wanting to be a writer were sort of writing these 
terrible knockoffs of whatever I was reading at the time. So when I read Terry Brooks, I would write these, you know, fantasy stories about the quests for some, you know, a ring or, or you know, the, the, the ma- some magic hat or something along those lines or, uh, you know, demonic clowns or, uh, or thing, you know, evil things that terrorize villages. Um, you know, I, I was probably, you know, eight to 12 at that point. So, you know, I don't think I knew what the word plagiarism meant, but <laughs> these stories were obviously inspiring me and, had me feel like I wanted to do my own. Um, and that was sort of my first dabbling my first time dabbling into the actual process of writing itself. Uh, it was highly unsuccessful, but everyone's got to start somewhere. Exactly. Exactly. You know, it's a, it's a special person who you, there are lots of people that love books and love stories and love to immerse themselves into another world. And then it, it's another thing altogether to finish that story and say, I'm going to continue this, you know, into my own world or create a world of my own. What do you think it is that uh, that separates people uh, from people who, that can just enjoy stories to someone who, uh, you know, feels the compulsion to do it as well? Oh, you know, part of me feels a little jealous about people who can just sort of read a story without any other uh, – and ambition beyond that. Um, I think that's how I used to be. You know, I used to be able to read, you know, when I was, you know, Stephen King and Brian Jockman, I could read a thousand page novel in two or three days. I would just sit there for hours and hours and hours. And that was it. Um, you know, I think I always loved being a storyteller. Um, even before I started writing uh, books of my own, I had a friend in high school and we sort of had our uh, a little agreement that we were going to be a filmmaking duo and I was going to be the writer and he was going to be the producer. I, I don't think he really knew what producing meant and I don't think I really knew what screenwriting was, <laughs> but we just had this notion of making movies together. Um, so I don't know what the separation is. It, it's a, a either a, um, a uh, something good or flaw in our brains that makes us always say, I want to do that too. And thankfully it doesn't lend itself to other things like baking or uh, car repair. Cause I think I'd be really terrible at those. Um, it's just storytelling. You know, when I watch a, a TV show or a movie or I read a good book, it just, it gets my juices flowing. It makes me feel it, it inspires me. Um, you know, if I, if I witness a story that's told so well, it just, makes me think like I want to do something that accomplishes that uh, in my own world. Right. Right. Um, as you're going through um, the, the motions of, of learning to write stories and uh, you know, always cranking out, you know, derivative works, but works regardless. Um, were there ever any, um, you know, adults of influence that recognize this thing in you, maybe a parent or a teacher or anything like that, and did they give you any encouragement to, uh, you know, that they recognized the storytelling gene and and encouraged you to go on? Yeah, there were a couple times. Um, I remember when I was in school, uh, I remember I'd show my teacher some of these stories, and you know, they'd always say, you know, keep going, keep going. Um, one of my my f- sort of fondest memories, I took. I remember taking a um, creative writing class when I was in college, and it was a, a fairly renowned teacher. And I remember speaking to a few students who had taken the class before, uh, and they said, "Any, you know, if you get a grade of an A minus or above, the teacher really feels like you have storytelling potential. Like there's really potential for something there." And I remember I got a B plus. And I think oh, to myself, man, so close. E- either you know, either I'm either this means I just I completely missed out and I'm going to be a failure, or maybe there's I can just inch it up a little bit. But I remember thinking that was so funny that. It was almost like a delineation mark that if you got an A minus or above, you were going to be a storyteller. Anything below that, you know, a B, a B plus might as well have been an F. Um, <laughs> so that was sort of a, a a awakening moment for me. Like, oh, I'm I'm this close, but does this mean I'm I'm destined to be a failure? And thankfully, I, I don't think it was. <laughs> did you did you ask the teacher about that or? I, I did, and they, they, you know, they weren't going to change our change grades just because I, I pled for it. Um, but you know, I think like anything, you know, as you become a writer, there are going to be people who tell you're great. There are going to be people who tell you that you're not so great, and in a weird way, you don't listen to any of them. You just right. keep doing your thing, and if you have talent, readers will come to it. And somebody might tell you you're the worst writer in the world, and you just say, "Hey, that's not the case. I'm going to keep going." Uh, somebody might also tell you you're a brilliant genius, and I think it behooves you to not listen to that either because then I think you start to rest on your laurels a little bit. So I think I've learned to, you know, there are going to be people who like you. There are going to be people who may not like you. And 
uh, if you keep doing what you're passionate about uh, and people hopefully want to keep publishing and keep people keep reading you, you're doing something right. Right. Well, it's, it's that, that adage of don't uh, believe your one-star or your five-star reviews. Exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's so weird because storytelling is such a uh, personal and, um, uh, you know, um, people's taste, um, you know, work into that as well. And there are uh, a group of people that will love your similar taste and some people just won't care for it. And, and that's okay. As long as you can find your audience. Absolutely. I mean, I think I remember, um, there was a, I want to say it was an author. I read an author interview a while back and they said, it made total sense to me that if you try to appeal to everyone, you're going to end up appealing to no one. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, I, I know that you write lots of other stuff besides novels. Um, how did you get started in, in writing and, and publishing, um, was it? Did you start with fiction uh, and then branch out, or did you uh, start with the, the columns and things that you write and work your way into fiction? It was really more fiction. Uh, you know, I've always the these sort of nonfiction pieces I've written have always either been in support of the books I've written or just when I have some free time and something interests me. But it always it comes back to fiction. Uh, you know, I've written a lot about the publishing industry. And writing careers, I've written a, you know a little bit on sort of the intersection of politics and publishing and writing. Um, in the end, I'm just, I'm, I love books. I love the written word. I love both publishing and writing. Uh, I do I do think it all stemmed from loving fiction at first, um, and then you know I began to to work in the industry, um, and I'm passionate about the publishing industry itself. And I'm always fascinated by sort of the way books can weave themselves in and out of our lives, both in a uh, I guess a literal sense, people just read books and enjoying it, but then also in sort of a more nebulous sense in that how books can affect things like politics and culture and writing about that kind of thing always interests me. Um, I would say, you know, I, I only tend to write those kind of pieces when I either have time, which with two small children at home is I don't get a whole lot of. Um, so it always goes, it's not like I'm, a, you know, they're freelance writers who write pieces day in and day out and that's how that's how they make their living and they're on deadline and they're and they're dedicated um i i don't have the bandwidth to do that between my you know running my my publishing company between the writing itself and then raising two kids so it's really just i write stuff when i'm only completely passionate about it uh and so it's you know a couple pieces a year year here and there maybe a few more when a book comes out and then it's really focusing on the on the novels themselves um, I discovered your work through the Mark, uh, the Henry Parker oh, yeah. uh, suspense thriller series, and uh, probably because I think Henry is a perfect name for a thriller protagonist. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, I, I love it. And um, when I, I've heard you, uh, I heard an interview with you one time, and you were talking about that uh, that desk drawer novel uh, that that will probably never see the light of day. Um, what was it about the Mark? Um, that you feel like was different from all of the other work that you had done and that this was the piece that, uh, uh, that you really launched your, your fiction writing career. I would say I gravitated towards the mystery thriller genre. That was the genre. I sort of, once I became an adult, I started to absolutely love. And that was the one that I think really, you know, put no pun intended, hit the mark for in terms of, a marriage of plot and character. Uh, I really wanted to write a really riveting plot driven story, but with characters that were interesting. And I think it was for me, it was the character of Henry because I think I started writing the mark when I was maybe 24 or 25. Uh, and Henry is about the same age in that book that I was when I began writing it. And really the inspiration for that character was in a lot of ways, the sense that a lot of protagonists in mystery and thriller fiction were, they tended to be a little bit older. They tended to be sort of, you know, middle-aged guys with a lot of baggage. Maybe they had, you know, two or three divorces under their belt. They paid alimony. They had a drinking problem. And I wanted to write a character that didn't have that sort of baggage, that Kate was coming into it fresh-faced and maybe, you know, optimistic, maybe a little naively optimistic. But I thought it'd be much more interesting to have a character that, you could see him accumulate baggage over time rather than sort of coming, you know, you don't see him in the first scene sitting in a bar, you know, sipping whiskey, uh, you know, lamenting something. Um, so it really came from wanting to write a character in a genre that I love 
the, the character that was sort of different. Um, and that's really where it kind of came from, um, you know, and putting him in a situation that is just completely, un, you know, crazy. Uh, and how does somebody, how does a 24, 25 year old react to that realistically? Uh, what would I do if I was in that situation? And I love the character of Henry. Uh, there were a lot of uh, traits of myself in him. And it just, it, it was the right book to launch things with. And I think character people respond to. Absolutely. Um, do you remember which book or, or author or series it was that, uh, that made you love mystery and thrillers? Yeah. I mean, Michael Connelly, I think, you know, I, almost every crime writer would use at the top of their list, but I love the Harry Bosch series going back to the black echo. I actually wrote a, when I was in, back to college, I took a class on the 20th century crime novel. And so we read all these great contemporary writers. We read uh, Walter Mosley. We read Michael Connelly. We read Sarah Paretsky. And I actually wrote a term paper on a Michael Connelly novel. Um, and it, it, to me, there's a cool thing in the world to actually write a term paper on Michael Connelly because I do feel like, you know, a lot of times there's valid criticism of the canon and that every kid is forced to read these same books by the same authors and sort of a very narrow focus on literature. So it was great to me to read books that I enjoyed that were part of the culture in a way that a lot of older writers were not. Um, so Michael Connelly, Dennis Lehane to me is absolutely almost at the pinnacle of what crime fiction can accomplish. I love the early Kenzie Gennaro novels. But to me, Mystic River is the kind of book I, I have to reread once a year because it almost is it's the pinnacle of what crime fiction can accomplish in terms of the marriage of story and plot and character and social uh, social ideas. Uh, Laura Lippman with her early Baltimore novels and now uh, what she's done with Sunburn and Lady in the Lake. Um, they're, they are definitely some of my favorite writers to read and sort of inspire me to do what I do and to hopefully do what I do even better. Right. Um, the Henry Parker series ran for five books, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and mm -hmm. somewhere along the way, uh, you got into the publishing side of of you know of, of publishing. Um, what was it that made you want to to be a publisher, and what do you feel like that adds to your creative life? So uh, it all stemmed from wanting to be a writer. I sort of I, I fell backwards into the industry in a lot of ways. Um, uh, when I was in college, I wrote this, you talk about the desk drawer novel. I wrote a terrible coming of age novel when I was in college. I think every writer probably has one terrible coming of age novel in them. Uh, this one will never see the light of day. But at the same time, I finished a book and it said to me, hey, I can I can do this. Um, it might not be good right now, but, you know, I'll get better. So I went to the head of our English department and I said to her, how does one become a writer? How do you become a novelist? And, she, and her response to me was, well, you need a literary agent. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess that makes sense. You know, actors have agents, musicians have agents. I guess I need an agent. So I bought one of those copies of, I think it was Writer's Marketplace. Um, you know, this is really before the internet became a much more useful tool. But it was one of those like 600 page books with a listing of every agent in the world. So I think I sent a query to maybe about 20 different agents essentially off asking them if they would represent my future books. Uh, I didn't actually query with a book. I just said, hey, I'm an aspiring writer in college. I have a lot of great stuff ahead of me. How about you represent me? Uh, little did I know, agents aren't keen to represent you if you haven't actually written anything to be represented. Uh, so I didn't get any responses or just got turned down flatly. But at the same time, I, I thought if I actually have any interest in learning this industry and getting published, I should learn how the industry works. Um, and at that time, I had actually interned for a couple summers at the Associated Press Sports Division. Uh, I was on the, the late night shift, I think it was 8 p.m. to, or no, um, 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. or 8, I think it was 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. It was the overnight shift because we had to cover the, uh, the, bas the baseball games on the West Coast. Um, so I ended up getting offered an internship at a literary agency because one of their clients was a prominent sports writer, and I had a background in sports. So they let me work on him with on his proposals, uh, essentially being an in-house editor for him, and I fell in love with it. I loved the editorial process. I loved helping him out. I was shocked that this you know renowned sports writer would actually listen to this dumb college student. Um, <laughs> But I love the editorial process, and that led to me uh, interviewing and trying to get into publishing. And I got eventually got hired at Warner Books, which is now uh, part, you know Hachette Book Group in Grand Central, 
Um, and that's how it started. So I, I sort of worked my way into publishing at the same time I was trying to become a writer. And I think it helped me because I learned the industry. I learned what worked. I learned about authors and how to deal with them. Uh, gave me a lot of great contacts. And I've sort of always had a long-term goal of hopefully publishing books that I love uh, and also writing books that I love. Do you feel like that it demystified uh, the the book uh, world? Uh, you know, when, you, when you're little and you, you get books and you and you read them and it's just all magical. And then one day you realize that a human wrote that book and something <laughs> clicks and you're like, oh, well, if, if they wrote it, then so can I. But then the, you know, the, the place where the books come from is all very, very much like Oz, um, you know, and and then pulling the curtain back. Well, this is just a group of people and they're working together to make these things, um, do, you know, kind of putting a human face on that. And, and seeing the inner workings of that, uh, did it sort of demystify the process to you? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I think when, when you're when you're little and you get a book, you just say, hey, it's a book. The author wrote this and then he snapped his fingers and it got, you know, it was at the bookstore. But then you realize, like, there's a cover designer. There is an editor on it. There was an agent who brokered the deal. There's a copy editor to make sure all the, you know, I's and I's were dotted and T's were crossed. Um, there was a managing editor. There were proofreaders. There's a printer. You don't think about any of that kind of stuff when you're young because it's just the book. Same way when you, you know when you're young and you see a movie, you know, you see Indiana Jones swinging through the jungle. You don't realize how long it took. You know, that 30 seconds of screen time probably took three weeks to set up. Um, so I think it was good for me to learn how that process worked because. Uh, I could understand the industry as a whole. And I do think that that's helped me in my writing a little bit because I know, and I can appreciate how much work goes into it. Even on Hideaway, my new book, uh, people read that book and it's, you know, the book that I, I wrote in solitude on my computer. But at the same time, like my editor did a phenomenal job just trying to, you know, pull a little bit more out of me. And the copy editors did a fantastic job. And I worked with the cover designer on it. And there's so many people that, that work on these books that, you know, are sort of unheralded. And I grew an appreciation for all that to know just how many people are involved in the, in the publication of one book. For sure. For sure. Um, how do you feel like that, you know, over the last decade, um, publishing has really changed in that we uh, had kind of the Kindle revolution and, um, you know, where people were reading differently. And then that kind of opened the doors uh, for other voices to come in and find an audience, um, you know, and the things have, have kind of shaken out and and had normalized. Uh, but how do you feel like that the electronic side of publishing has changed the entire landscape? Oh, I mean, I think it's changed it for the better for the most part. Um, you know, I think it's it's one of the best things it's done is increase the long tail of a book. Um you know, before the sort of digital revolution, a book would come out, um, it would get, you know, publicity for, you know, maybe a couple weeks or before or after publication, then maybe it would come out in paperback, if it would come out in hardcover and get maybe a second month after that. And then it would sort of just, you know, end up on the shelves and either disappear or not. Uh, nowadays, it's and then if a, if a store didn't have any copies, well, you weren't getting a copy. Nowadays, you can get any book anywhere, anytime. And I think that really helps people discover all these classics that helps people discover store uh, series. Um, if people love a book, uh, a book, first book in a series, they can get the next five books in a series within the next five minutes. Um, I think it's also opened the door for a lot of talented authors who may not have been found otherwise. Uh, you know, whether it's self-publishing, whether it's independent publishing, um, the truth is publishing, it's a very subjective business. And, you know, as a publisher myself, like I turned down a lot of books that are probably pretty good and just, I didn't respond to them in the way somebody else would. And there's no reason that author can't go out and try to find an audience on their own. Um, so I think it opened the door for a lot of readers to discover books that would have been much harder to find otherwise, for talented writers to sort of find a, an alternate route into the publication process. Um, you know, so I, I, I'm all in favor of it. I, I read both ebooks and uh, print books. I have, you know, enormous overflowing sh bookshelves both in my office and at home. But at the same time, I probably have 100 books on my Kindle that I've yet to read. So I love the notion of just books being available to you wherever and whenever you want. I love it, too. Let's talk about Hideaway and Rachel Marin. Um, mm -hmm. this, this is such a fantastic book. I loved it. 
Um, it's oh, a little different. So well, sure, it, it's a little different from your Henry series. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, kind of, who is first off? Let's start. Who is Rachel Marin, and where did she come from for you? So Rachel Marin is a uh, single mother. Uh, she's a widow. Um, something horrific happened to her family uh, that uh, shattered her life and the lives of her two young children and uh, forced her to relocate uh, from her hometown to a smaller town to get away from everything um, to essentially escape this traumatic event in her past. And since then, she has, uh, because the world and system let her down, she has essentially honed herself into a uh, a brilliant, uh, someone who's able to who's who's both brilliant and uh, a bit of a fighter um, because she needs to protect her children. She needs to protect herself against the people that let her down. Um, But at the same time, uh, when there's a murder in her small town, she finds that justice doesn't always work the way it's expected to. So she gets involved in the case to try to find uh, to find a killer. Detectives on the case. And by pushing into this uh, into this investigation, she might expose the secret that she's been running on from for all these years. So uh, she's a mother. She's a widow. She's something of a, of a vigilante, a bit of a criminalist. To me, she's almost sort of like uh, Sherlock Holmes meets Sarah Connor from Terminator 2. Uh, she's brilliant. She's strong. She's capable. But she's also very, very vulnerable. And I, I love the idea of sort of like how with Henry, uh, you didn't see a lot of characters in thriller fiction that were on the young side to me i felt like there weren't, weren't a lot of main characters on the thriller side who had children who had people that were dependent on them uh, a lot of char- a lot of thriller characters are kind of loners they can go out and solve murders and go back home and do whatever they do but if rachel's getting involved in investigation she still has two young children she has to make dinner for them she has to make sure they're safe and i thought that'd be a really interesting way to uh to start a series so how does somebody who's brilliant and capable and able to essentially be a crime fighter uh, balance that with having two small children. And it all stemmed from that. Um, so I love the character. She felt different to me. Uh, I started writing the book uh, soon after my wife and I had our, had our first daughter. Um, and it's not, it's the kind of book I could not have written before kids because it's really is, even though Rachel is a single mother and I'm a married father, uh, there's a lot of similarities between the two of us, and I couldn't have written it before I became a parent. I, I was going to ask you that. Um, that I, I love that. Um, you know, we we've all seen superhero stories and and comic books where um, the the hero can't have any sort of relationship and can't find happiness because his family or, or her family. Um, you know, are are targets uh, because of what mm-hmm. they do, and yeah. and you you took that trope but pulled the rug out from under it and said, well, well, she just has to, you know, she doesn't have the choice yeah. to say no, I can't do that. Um, yeah, you know, what does that as a writer, um, how does that up the ante uh, for for how she behaves and how she approaches what she does, knowing that there's no way around this that that this is her Achilles heel always will be, but she's got to push through it anyway. Absolutely. You hit her right on the head there. I mean, that to me, that's the conflict right there is that she's someone who's very capable and very strong and could be sort of a brilliant detective on her own, but has two small children. Now, most of us might look at that and say, Hey, you know, I'm not going to get involved. It's too dangerous, but she just, she's seen how the system has failed people. Um, she sees how when this, uh, it's, it's the former mayor of the town is, is found dead. And this is a woman who was very talented, who had a great life ahead of her, who was loved by many. And it, Rachel feels that if she doesn't get involved, she could just essentially be discarded, another life forgotten. And Rachel is not going to let that happen. Uh, she had a, a little bit of a relationship with this woman. The woman showed a kindness to her. Um, and so Rachel, just she's, she feels like she must get involved otherwise the system is going to let down somebody else. Um, so I thought that would create conflict right away. Uh, and Rachel is not infallible. She makes sometimes poor decisions. She thinks what she's doing is for the best. But I think people will read it and question what she does sometimes. But once they understand her, they understand why she does it. Um, and I think that makes her both a flawed uh, heroine but also a really compelling one too. Well, and, and we – we are much more prone to forgive shortcomings when there's a good motivation there, exactly. uh, which exactly. as a writer allows you to do much more interesting things. If you can endear 
the uh, you know the, the protagonist to the audience, um, that allows you to throw all kinds of twists and, and stuff at us. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I you know there are definitely times when Rachel sort of uh, I'd say skirts the edge of of you know doing things that could be frowned upon, but she always does have the right motivation. She wants to see justice done, and I think anybody could relate to that. Um, even if they they can't do what she does, they want to see justice served. And, you know, she wants to do the right thing for her kids. She wants to help her kids overcome the traumas they've experienced. But at the same time, she can let essentially this, you know, the killer go unpunished. Jason, when you when you come up with a premise uh, like you did in Hideaway and you've, and you've got the character – um, and you know you you believe that you have the character motivations and all of the things that you need to begin a book. Uh, what does the planning phase of a book like this look like for you? So it also it started with the character of Rachel. Um, I the character came to me first. I knew I wanted her to be a a mother and a widow. I thought that'd be really interesting. Um, and then it was sort of the story. What was going to be the uh, I sort of knew the conflict that made Rachel who she is and what the trauma was that uh, forced her to essentially abandon her former life. But what was going to be the conflict that essentially almost forced her out of hiding in some ways? And then what was she going to do about it? Um, so it became a bit of, of a dual narrative in that I wanted to show Rachel investigating this crime and sort of working outside the law. But I also thought it'd be really interesting uh, to show how Rachel came to be who she is. You know, I was a big fan of the, of the TV show Lost. And one of the reasons I love the show Lost is because it didn't just show the castaways on the island, but it showed, the, showed who they were before the island and how they got there. So I thought it would be really sort of fascinating to have like a bit of a dual narrative show, Rachel's investigation in the present day uh, and everything she was doing to essentially uh, to find this killer, but also how she came to be who she is now. What were the conflicts? What... How did she go from sort of a, a very mild mannered wife and mother to essentially, you know, being this uh, someone who's hard edged and tough with a tough exterior, but also a brilliant mind? Why did she decide to do that? I thought it'd be really interesting to kind of see both of those parallel stories unfolding at the same time because there are just so many mysteries in it. Um, and, it'd be, and once I sort of had those timelines in mind, it really it became such a joy to write because it was a mystery to me. Uh, I wanted to know how Rachel got to be who she was. And I wanted to know how she would find this killer with or without the police. Well, um, hideaway is the first book in a new series, uh, with, with Rachel Marin. Um, obviously your, uh, your publisher gave that away by calling it book one. <laughs> <laughs> um, when, when you start thinking about this new character, um, how far in the future, um, can you see where this uh, series is going? Or do you just recognize that this character has potential and, you know, I, I need to take her on this adventure, wrap it up as best I can and leave, um, you know, possibilities open for the future. Um, how far away are you thinking when you start a new series like this? Well, I, I knew I wanted this book to be this hideaway to start a series. Um, it, the book ends with, you know, I think you want us to know more about Rachel Marin, where it's sort of, you know, it may close the central conflict, but it also leaves a lot of questions about who she is, what she does, her relationship to the other characters in the book. Um, and that was something that I really wanted to explore going forward. Uh, I'm actually just finishing up edits on book on, on the second book, uh, which is called uh, a stranger at the door, which will be out early, uh, early next year. Um, and it's sort of after, as I'm finishing up that book, I'm thinking, what do I see in the future? Uh, do I want to do more books? Uh, how many do I want to do? Uh, do I want it to be sort of a, you know, Lee Child, Jack Reacher situation where you can pick up any book at any time and not need to know the backstory? Or do I want it to sort of be uh, almost like a, a TV show like The Wire or The Sopranos where uh, each book builds into the next one and there's and readers really feel rewarded and enriched by starting at the beginning and seeing the characters grow and unfold, in which case, you know, there probably would be uh, an end frame. I don't think you can keep that up for 20 plus books. Um so I'm sort of at that point right now. Do I, you know, I'd like to do more with Rachel. Uh, I don't fully know how many more. I think that'll be up to uh, how her story unfolds, how readers react. So far, the readers, the real reactions have been absolutely phenomenal. So they, they want more of her. Um, and as long as people want to keep reading her and there are stories to tell, um, 
I think I, I want to keep writing her. Absolutely. The new book is called Hideaway. It is the first Rachel Marin thriller. Um, Jason, uh, we're going to put links to it in the show notes uh, for those uh, so that so people can go buy their copy, uh, which came out yesterday, by the way, when you're hearing this. Um, Jason, if people want to dig into all the stuff that you do and find out more about you, is there a place online where they can connect with you? Uh, there uh, is, are there too many places online they can connect with me. <laughs> uh, uh, you go to my website, which is uh, jasonpinter.com, and there you can find information about Hideaway and all my other books, uh, links to other uh, nonfiction pieces I've written, uh, and I'm on Twitter and Instagram uh, at, at Jason Pinter. Um, uh, I'm on Facebook, too, a Facebook time. fan page. Uh, I am not on Snapchat or TikTok. And if anybody has a teenager who can show me how to do all of that, I'm all ears. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Jason, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. We're going to put links to all of that great stuff in the show notes of this episode. Uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, I love Hideaway. I can't wait to see what you do with it. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. That means a lot to me. I am really, I really appreciate it. And have a way to bring him a martini, which he would down before he hit the... <laughs> Stay tuned now for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. The near future. Humanity, structure of story, and things like that. But I, I really enjoyed the creative process. The probe slowed as the sun's heliosphere disrupted the graviton wave it rode in on from the abyss of deep space. Awakened by the sudden deceleration, the probe absorbed the electromagnetic spectrum utilized by its target species and assessed the technological sophistication of the sole sentient species on Earth. The probe adjusted its course to take it into the system's primary. If the humans couldn't survive, with its help, what was to come, then the probe would annihilate itself. There would be no trace of it for the enemy, and no chance of humanity's existence beyond the time it had until the enemy arrived. The probe analyzed filed patents, military expenditures, birth rates, mathematical advancement, and space exploration. The first assessment fell within the margin of error of survival and extinction for humanity. The probe's programming allowed for limited, autonomous decision-making, choice being a rare luxury for the probe's class of artificial intelligence. The probe found itself in a position to choose between ending its mission in the sun's fire and a mathematically improbable defense of humanity, and the potential compromise of its much larger mission. Given the rare opportunity to make its own decision, the probe opted to dither. In the week it took to pass into Jupiter's orbit, the probe took in more data. It scoured the Internet for factors to add to the assessment, but the assessment remained the same. Unlikely, but possible. By the time it shot past Mars, the probe still hadn't made a decision. As the time to adjust course for Earth or continue into the sun approached, the probe conducted a final scan of cloud storage servers for any new information and found something interesting. While the new information made only a negligible impact on the assessment, the probe adjusted course to Earth. It hadn't traveled all this way for nothing. In the desert south of Phoenix, Arizona, it landed with no more fanfare than a slight thump and a few startled cows. Then it broke into the local cell network and made a call. Mark Ibarra awoke to his phone ringing at max volume, playing a pop ditty that he hated with vehemence. He rolled off the mattress that lay on the floor and crawled on his hands and knees to where his cell was recharging. His roommate, who paid the majority of their rent and got to sleep on an actual bed, grumbled and let off a slew of slurred insults. Mark reached his cell and slapped at it until the offending music ended. He blinked sleep from his eyes and tried to focus on the caller's name on the screen. The only people who'd call at this ungodly hour were his family in Bosque country, or maybe Jessica in his applied robotics course, wanted a late-night study break. 
The name on the screen was Answer Me. He closed an eye and reread the name. It was way too early, or too late, depending on one's point of view, for this nonsense. He turned the ringer off and went back to bed. Sleep was about to claim him when the phone rang again, just as loudly as last time, but now with a disco anthem. Seriously? His roommate slurred. Mark declined the call and powered the phone off. He flopped back on his bed and curled into his blanket. To hell with my first class, he thought. Arizona State University had a lax attendance policy, one which he'd abused for nights like this. The cell erupted with big band music. Mark took his head out from beneath the covers and looked at his phone like it was a thing possessed. The phone vibrated so hard that it practically danced a jig on the floor, and the screen flashed Answer Me over and over again as music blared. Dude, said his roommate, now sitting up in his bed. Mark swiped the phone off the charging cord, and the music stopped. The caller's name undulated with a rainbow of colors, and an arrow appeared on the screen, pointing to the button he had to press to answer the call. When did I get this app? He thought. Mark sighed and left the bedroom, meandering into the hallway bathroom with the grace of a zombie. The battered mattress he slept on played hell with his back and left him stiff every morning. Dropping his boxers, he took a seat on the toilet and answered the call, determined to return this caller's civility with some interesting background noise. What? he murmured. Mark Ibarra, I need to see you. The voice was mechanical, asexual in its monotone. Do you have any friggin' idea what time it is? Wait, who the hell is this? You must come to me immediately. We must discuss the mathematical proof you have stored in document title This Can't Be Right dot doc. Mark shot to his feet. The boxers around his ankles tripped him up, and he stumbled out of the bathroom and fell against the wall. His elbow punched a hole in the drywall, and the cell clattered to the floor. He scooped the phone back up and struggled to breathe as a sudden asthma attack came over him. <laughs> how? How? He couldn't finish his question until he found his inhaler in the kitchen mere steps away in the tiny apartment. He took a deep breath from the inhaler and felt the tightness leave his lungs. That someone knew of his proof was impossible. He'd finished it earlier that night and had encrypted it several times before loading it into a cloud file that shouldn't have been linked to him in any way. How do you know about that? He asked. You must come to me immediately. There is little time. Look at your screen the robotic voice said. His screen changed to a map program, displaying a pin in an open field just off the highway, connecting Phoenix to the suburb of Maricopa. Come. Now. Mark grabbed his keys. An hour later, his jeans ripped from scaling a barbed wire fence, Mark was surrounded by desert scrub. The blue of the morning rose behind him, where his beat-up Honda waited on the side of the highway. With his cell to it... Some things you write now, uh, do they differ in the writing process from... Uh, from Plants looked a lot like benign mesquite trees in the darkness. A Native American casino in the distance served as his north star, helping him keep his bearings. You're not out here, are you? I'm being punked, aren't I? He asked the mysterious caller. You are 9.26 meters to my east-southeast. Punk, decayed wood, used as tinder. Are you on fire? The caller said. Mark rolled his eyes. This wasn't the first time the caller had used the non-standard meanings of words during what passed as conversation between the two. 
Mark had tried to get the caller to explain how he knew about his theorem and why they had to meet in the middle of the desert. The caller had refused to say anything. He would only reiterate that Mark had to come quickly to see him, chiding him every time Mark deviated from the provided driving directions. If you're so close, why can't I see you? he asked. He took a few steps in what he thought was a northwesterly direction and squished into a cow patty.